put it in a limit the length of emergency declarations, among some other things. Uh, why did you think that was necessary? Well, I think a lot of people don't feel the voice of the average citizen is being heard. As their representatives, we've tried very hard. I'm sure you're well aware that we have introduced multiple bills to try to open Pennsylvania back up, only to have one after another being vetoed. These were not done recklessly. These were done trying to be very careful because we also realize whether it's trying to support our local hospitals, libraries, schools, or even those that are on unemployment, we have to have some cash flow to do that. To completely shut down the economy is not going to help anybody, and these things still need to be paid for. But we believe that the voice of the people also comes from their elected representatives and their senators. One of the first things that we tried to introduce as the COVID thing hit and the legislature reconvened was put a task force together, a task force that would allow the House, the Senate, ours, D's, and the administration to work together on trying to solve some of these issues and to be dictating policy. That did not happen. That was not received very well. And most of the decisions of shutdowns, closings, who can do whatever, was done strictly by the administration. We believe in any disaster, the General Assembly should have some voice. And so that constitutional amendment says that after 21 days, the General Assembly has to be part of a governor's declaration to extend that. And we believe that's important. We pass it this session. We will have to do it again in the beginning of next session before it goes to you, the voters, so that you have a voice to say, yes, we agree with that. Our elected representatives ought to be part of those de disaster declarations. And the last thing I'll say to that, we're currently under three disaster declarations. A lot of people don't realize that. And one of them is years old, and that has to do with the opioid addiction problem here in the Commonwealth, which is still very prevalent. The General Assembly just wants to be a participant in that and be able to take your voices to Harrisburg. Now, in, in emergencies, there's often a need for a decisive decision making. Uh, how do you balance the, the autonomy that a governor may need to make decisions with the consultative process with the legislature? Well, I'm very respectful that we have three branches of government for a reason. But again, it goes back to your earlier question of me as a leader, and the governor is also a leader. Communication is paramount, an open dialogue. Uh, frankly, there's some tough decisions, and I don't envy a governor having to decide whether or not to take the risk of people getting ill in their state and losing some individuals and or trying to keep the economy going. I do believe a balance can be struck by having better communications, and frankly, one of the things I tell a lot of young people that visit the Capitol or when I go in a classroom, there's a reason why we have a House chamber of 203 members with different ideas. And one thing I try to encourage is that you have an inherent responsibility to listen to each other, listen to another person's opinion regardless of where they are from the state. And it may not change your vote ultimately, and it may not even change your opinion, but it will teach you something. And you will learn from those interpersonal um, relationships and those dialogues. And sometimes I think that gets lost as the levels go higher. We get frustrated sometimes with the courts and obviously with administrations over either party and I think a closer working relationship is very beneficial. At the end of the day, a governor still has the ability to not vote, pardon me, to veto a bill or not sign a bill, but better open dialogue, especially in disasters, is paramount and frankly, what I think the average citizen is, expects. So when you look back over the past several months of dealing with this pandemic, has the relationship between the governor and uh, the legislature changed? Has it, uh, is, has it improved from your point of view? It could probably uh, be better if we were given prior notice of decisions. We get notification a couple of hours before a press conference is going to occur with a new declaration or maybe a new proclamation of shutting down a business or, or minimizing the participation to another percentage dropping from 50% uh, to 25% as we saw with the restaurants. But that doesn't do us much good other than it would give us a warning. We would rather be part of the dialogue and say, wait a minute, have you thought about the fact that you have three hot spots in the state that you're worried about, and yet we're going to do a blanket closure or a 25% uh, reduction, taking restaurants down to 25% in areas that may have only ever had two COVID cases since the pandemic started. That type of blanket, blanket decisions would probably occur less if the General Assembly was more engaged in these dialogues prior to the press conferences. 
Now, in a press release from July 15th, in response to Governor Wolf implement, implementing limits on restaurant operations and other business operations, uh, you expressed concern about, quote, uh, the governor's continued overreach and misuse of power, unquote. Uh, what specifically were you talking about? Well, again, the lack of communication overall, just kind of unilaterally uh, making a decision when you have representative government. A lot of people think this is about restaurants and bars open, but they don't understand that the impact on other industries, whether it's the trucking industry, the farming industry, farming is taking significant hits with these restaurants closing because we forget how much milk is used and the closing of schools. The consumption of milk has reduced significantly. The cheese products that are made from milk are significant, not to mention your other local businesses, that we try to give a little more global perspective in these dialogues because I think that we can balance protecting people's health and using different innovative what manners, which I've seen in different businesses. It's actually been pretty interesting to see how quickly a business will adapt when put under pressure because they wanna survive. They have bills to pay, they have staff to pay, they're employing our family, friends, and neighbors, not just providing a service to us. The other part of that is there are other businesses that are going to work. So why do we arbitrarily decide this business can't work and this one can? It's just very frustrating for Americans that like to believe in freedom and liberties that there are cherry picking of who can work and who cannot, who can be open. And as consumers, for the most part, we like choice. And so our, our request to the governor is involve us prior to making these declarations. Don't just tell us what's gonna happen. We represent the people just as much. It's not a, a, a power grab, it's about trying to share the decision making, which I believe the average citizen expects out of their democratic republic. Now, are there things that uh, the state government can provide in terms of assistance to help these businesses uh, get through this time period? Well, as you know, we got about $3.9, almost $4 billion through the federal government and COVID CARES dollars, which we have disseminated all but about $1.1 billion of that. A uh, large percentage that was given to the counties because of local control. We too felt that they should have some decision making abilities on that. We directed some dollars to obviously our, you know, pardon me, our emergency services people in our hospitals. But we're also trying to provide um, guidance. And as I said, I would like to see the Department of Education, along with the administration, try to provide guidance on how to carefully open schools because I think that's a significant issue in our communities. And we continue to try to provide resources for our, our local leaders, uh, whether it's uh, township bout borough individuals. Uh, most recently, as you may have known, we had a bill passed to allow for open exposure to what's going on in state government and the right to know. Uh, through the pandemic, there's been concerns that the public doesn't really know exactly what's going on in state government at time, which could include the lighting of contracts and whether they're competitive or not. That bill passed overwhelming in the House and the Senate. And there was talk that the administration was going to veto it. And fortunately, instead of vetoing it, not choosing to sign it, they just let it become law. That's significant. You've got to have open oversight of government at all levels, pandemic or not. And I was glad to see the governor's administration at least chose to let that become law. So we're, those are the kind of things that we're pushing for. Because government's going to continue to run regardless of pandemic or not, because we're here to serve people. The last thing I'd say, uh, probably the most frustrating, is the lack of smooth sailing in the unemployment compensation with 3.4 million Pennsylvanians, a lifetime high unemployed. We've still struggle. I just spoke to a woman last night, has seven children, has not received a single check in 15 weeks, and, and now has a vehicle that's just about on its last leg. It's over 200,000 miles on this car, and she's very concerned where she's going to go from here. And we are struggling to get the labor and industry department to get a smooth flow in getting these checks out. Now, as a result of the pandemic, a limited budget was passed in the spring with the intent of doing the second part but by the end of November. Uh, are discussions about that budget uh, ongoing now? Now, uh, they have begun uh, more aggressively. I've had several meetings with our chairman of the Appropriations Committee. 